today we're going to take a look at how to close up a wall that used to be a doorway. Now one fun thing to note with any project in a house is to never assume that anything is ever square. As we see the wall is not a 90 degree corner and I already know that the top is not square and level either. This becomes more of an issue as we move on. The first thing we need to do is verify how wide our wall is and in this case it is a 5.5 inch wall. This means that they either used custom lumber or the drywall is doubled up on a standard 2x4 frame, which is what I assume they likely did. However, I didn't feel like doubling up the drywall as that's not ever really ideal to do, so I ripped down some 2x6s to 4.5 inches to accommodate for a total of 1 inch of drywall. I've also gone ahead and marked the wall at half an inch on either side for where my framing needs to line up with. Now it's time to prepare the area for having my framing put in. I'd like to have a perfectly flat floor to put the framing on, but that's not going to happen here. There's actually about a half inch drop between these two rooms, so the best I can do is remove the transition strip and the quarter round. The transition strip was held on with brad nails and some construction adhesive, so it was just a matter of getting my pry bar under it and prying it up and out without pulling up the rest of the floor with it. For the quarter round, I cut the caulking that was at the top of it with my 5-in-1 tool and then pried it out, as it's just held in by brad nails. Once both are removed, we can move on to getting our measurements. When it comes to measuring for something that you know isn't square, you'll want to take more measurements than you see me do here, and it does eventually come back to bite me. Ideally, you would do round 6 measurements, vertically, one from each end and one in the middle, and same with horizontally from top to bottom and one in the middle. This will let you adjust your cuts for your framing to accommodate the area, even if it's not square. When it comes to cutting your lumber, there's not too much to it, just measure the length you need from both the front and back edge, use your speed square to get a straight line, and carefully cut along your line. I'm sure you guys will let me know down in the comment section how unsafe I'm being by doing all of this in sandals and not wearing safety glasses, and, well, you're right. If you don't trust standard lumber dimensions, and you really shouldn't as a 2x4 is actually 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches, go ahead and lay your header and footer down on the floor and remeasure the height for your inner lumber taking measurements at both ends and also in the center. If you have a wall that isn't square, you'll want to mark each piece of inner lumber in regards to where it would go on the wall. In my case, I just cut the two right side ones a bit shorter to accommodate for the minor drop in the top of the wall. Here you can see me just simply verifying that the wall frame should actually fit once I screw everything together. Now it's time to actually build the wall and get everything put together. Wall studs are supposed to be 16 inches on center, on center meaning the center of the lumber. Since the section of the wall that we're working on is only 61 inches, we can't perfectly space all of them at 16 inches. You can choose to either put them all at an equal distance apart, or you can put the middle stud in at whatever the center is, which in my case was around 14 inches instead of 16. Once I have the header and footer marked out, I then moved all of my lumber to their approximate locations where we can actually see something that ends up becoming a bit of an issue for me down the line. We can see that most of this lumber is warped and twisted. I'm able to mitigate this while screwing it, everything together, but you'll see that it takes some interesting methods to get it to go together properly. You can either nail things together, ideally with a nail gun and not a hammer, or you can use my method for these smaller projects of using screws. Go ahead and use your speed square to make sure you're getting everything set to a 90 degree angle, and that's as square as it can be. I 
I feel like this would be a wonderful time to have an audible sponsorship since we can see I clearly have my earbuds in and am listening to something. We could easily say I was listening to a book on Audible. Granted, I'm not. I'm listening to Karf Darko and his wonderful 8-bit style of music. Wow, we can really see just how warped everything is. It's no wonder I had such a pain of a time with it. We can see that I decided to be a bit smarter on the header here and pre-screwed my 10 screws so I wouldn't be fighting with it during the process of trying to get it all put together. The outside boards are a bit easier to work with with the twist as I was able to just stand the whole wall assembly up and then stand on it to get to the desired angle that I wanted, but the rest of it wasn't quite as easy. I tried using a hammer to no avail as it just bounced right back to where it was. I was hoping there would be enough friction between the boards to hold it all together, but I wasn't that lucky. What I ended up doing was using a cutoff from earlier and cut it to fit between the cavity, somewhere around 15 and a quarter inches, and hammered it down into the cavity to force the board to be where I wanted it to be, and then screwed it together. And then I had to cut it again for the center stud. This ended up working out wonderfully, and I was able to get everything put together the way I wanted it. Time to put the framed wall in, and it fits in beautifully. It's a nice and tight fit that required only minimal hammering to get where I wanted. You can see me re-measure my distances on the wall to try and get it as centered as I could on the prior wall. Once I had everything where I wanted it to be, it was time to screw it to the existing wall. I just simply put a screw in between every stud on the top plate and then put four down on the wall on either side. This should keep it in the wall without moving at all, unless the whole wall goes. It's time to get our drywall cut and put up, which means it's time to measure everything. Again. I finally realized I was being dumb earlier and take multiple measurements to try and make this fit as well as I can. I start with measuring the width at the top at 4 feet down, as that's how long the piece of drywall is, and then at the center at the 2 foot mark. I write down my measurements on my framing as it just makes it easy for me to reference. I also went ahead and measured the width for the bottom pieces of drywall as well, since I'm here. Ideally, you'll have a straight edge or a drywall square to measure and cut everything. I, uh, I forgot mine. So I had to make do with what I had on hand, which you'll see change pretty much with every cut. After making your measurement, you'll go ahead and take your razor blade and score the front side of the drywall. 
After it's scored, you simply pick up the drywall and apply pressure to where you scored, and it will break along that line. Then just use your razor blade to cut through the brown paper side, and it should come apart pretty easily. Once it's cut, go ahead and make sure everything fits, and then we can get on to screwing it onto the wall. Welcome to the back side of the wall where everything is much dimmer. There's literally only one light in this section of the house, and I swear it's only like a 500 lumen light bulb. It's, it's terrible. You can see me go ahead and mark the location of the studs on the walls, and go ahead and lift everything in place to start screwing it, and uh, oh, I, uh, I have the wrong bit for drywall. For some reason I have a number 3 Phillips instead of a number 2. Now that I have everything ready, I lift the drywall back up and start by putting two screws in at the bottom to hold it in place. When putting your screws in, go nice and slow as you only want the screws right below the surface of the drywall, not all the way through. I typically put it four screws in per stud or about one per foot. And for those wondering why there's brown paper on the windows, I, I don't really know. I just, I, I don't question these things when I help people. I mean, I could say the same thing for why they want to close in this section of the house. I, I don't understand why but who am I to question it? Now that we have the first piece of drywall up, it's time to measure the height that we need for the bottom piece as it's less than four feet. Staying true to forgetting my straight edge, I grabbed the transition piece from earlier to mark my line. I then went ahead and marked the width of the piece before cutting it. Most of the time, cutting the width will always be easier to do first over cutting the length, as you'll then be working with less than a full 8 foot sheet of drywall. After everything is cut, it's time to work on getting it to fit the cavity. I always try to make my drywall as precise as possible, and that's actually more of a hindrance than you'd think. Your drywall doesn't have to be perfect, as the tape you use is around 2 inches wide and will hide your bad cuts and measurements. I say this because you can see me having to shave down the drywall to get it to fit pretty much perfectly, and even hammer in the bottom ever so slightly, which isn't really ideal to do. Once everything is in place and where you want it, go ahead and put your screws in. And now thankfully we're back to the side with good lighting. You'll see me fight a good bit with this piece and I couldn't figure out why for the longest of the time while I was trying to get it to fit. Sadly the camera wasn't high enough to show the issue, but essentially what happened was the piece of drywall wasn't matching up with both of the top corners, and it shouldn't have. I forgot that the wall was sloping ever so slightly down on this side, which left a gap at the top left edge of the drywall. Once I realized what the issue was, I put the piece up, squared it with the side of the wall, and then screwed it in. As I mentioned earlier, our tape will cover you know, up to about an inch worth of gap, so this isn't an issue. I just couldn't realize what was going on while I was trying to work the piece and may have gotten a little frustrated. You can also see me use my razor blade to shave down ever so slightly on the left side of the wall here. 
This is just another example of me trying to get the piece to fit far too well and not letting the drywall tape do what it's designed to do. Time for the final piece of drywall. After measuring out the wall, I use my new straight edge, an offcut from another piece of drywall, to mark and cut the length and width as needed. Yet again, I spent time fighting with the drywall to get it to be an almost perfect fit into the space when it really is not necessary. I actually ran into a bit of an issue at the end of this, which you'll see in just a few moments, and my rather unorthodox method of correcting it. Or at least working with it more, however you want to say it. I'll go into more details on that in just a moment. Alright, so if I'm going to get some hateful comments down below, this will definitely be why. This is not something you typically do. You do not normally take a sander to your drywall and even out your mistakes between the two pieces. I'm fully aware of this. Also, if you're sanding drywall, hook up your shop vac and wear a mask. I, uh, I forgot mine. For, I forgot both. Okay, I know, it's bad. So let's talk about what happened here. Most would assume that my framing was not right, and, uh, well, you're technically right. As we saw, the lumber used was quite warped. Essentially what happened was that the frame was cut to 4.5 inches, but when strained out, parts of it were technically wider. This caused the lower section of the right side to be proud of the wall almost a quarter of an inch. Now, you can fix this with drywall mud. You would have to tape it out a couple of feet, and, or not tape it out, you'd mud it out a couple of feet, and I was not wanting to do that. So I've tried a different and technically not correct method to mitigate doing that. Since I will have drywall tape over the exposed sheetrock, it should be fine. If I'd realized the issue before putting the wall up, I would have fixed it then, but I didn't. Some people are really good at drywall and mudding, and this is not a step that they do. I'm pre-cutting my drywall tape for each section, so that way I can quickly get it embedded in my mud. Professionals are able to just do this on the fly, and it's pretty impressive. I'm not that good. I do drywall as a basic homeowner that's needed to fix things or renovate things. Time to mix up our first batch of mud. That big number 20 on the bag indicates the approximate working time of this mud before it sets in a sandable, which is supposed to be 20 minutes. In my experience, uh, it's, it's never accurate. You either have like five minutes or five hours, and there's no real in between. A, a lot of it depends on humidity, temperature, temperature of the water, a bunch of different little small factors. Uh, typically speaking, 
for your first coat, you would likely use 60 minute mud and mix up like a gallon at a time to go through. Since I'm working on a small section and not the quickest person ever when it comes to drywall mud, I'm using 20 minute mud and mixing up a quart at a time. I don't really like using the pre-mixed stuff that you can buy in the large, I think, three gallon buckets, as it tends to shrink and crack if you try to fill any gaps with it, like anything bigger than a quarter of an inch, and you can only do very thin coats. As for consistency, when mixing drywall mud, it's best to go a little thinner as it will thicken up as time goes on. Uh, you kind of want it like a thick pancake batter. You want it to be able to move when you flip the cup upside down, but not pour out. We're on to the final part of this video, and it's the first coat of mud in taping the joints. Everything after this is just basic sanding and adding more mud and then painting. If you're curious about the different ways to do drywall, I actually have a few videos that are in a playlist that go through a few different scenarios. But the basics for this part are pretty straightforward. Put a base layer of mud on the wall, put your drywall tape over the mud, and then use your drywall knife to press the tape into the mud, pressing out the excess mud by moving your knife along the tape. After your excess mud has been removed, put another thin layer of mud over the tape and taper it out. You can tape your edges by applying pressure to the outside edge of your drywall knife and letting the inside edge float along the top of the mud. It's much easier to remove a ridge in the center than it is to blend a thick edge, so it's always best to make sure you, your edges are tapered and flat. Fun fact, this original section was 28 minutes long and a 20 gigabyte file. I've sped it up about 10 times the original speed just to not have this video go on forever. This is a pretty simple and basic video showing how to frame up and enclose a wall cavity. It's a pretty straightforward process that most anyone can do with basic tools in a little bit of time, and there's minimal risk of damaging your home doing this. Now, if we're talking about removing a wall, that's a whole other story and issue that comes with a lot of risks. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, gripes, whatever, uh, let me know in the comment section down below. I try to make it a point to respond to every single comment I get, and I'm always open to criticism and feedback. As always, if you like the content I'm putting out, make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date on all new content as it comes out. That's all that we have for now. Thanks so much for watching and have a wonderful day.